Did you know that only 11 elements make up about 99% of our world? That's not a lot, and yet we are surrounded by an amazing variety of different substances. That complexity results from all the different ways those elements can chemically bind to each other to form different compounds. You know that there are two major types of chemical bonds, ionic and covalent. During ionic bond formation, electrons are transferred from one element to another, forming positively and negatively charged ions. This generally occurs between metals and nonmetals. Metals tend to lose electrons while nonmetals gain them. Electrostatic attractions between oppositely charged ions result in the formation of large crystal lattices, like the one depicted for sodium chloride here. This crystal lattice structure is responsible for some of the major physical properties of ionic compounds. Mainly, they are all crystalline solids with very high melting points. On the other hand, when a covalent bond is formed, electrons are shared between atoms. These atoms are usually both nonmetals, neither of which can easily give up electrons. Because electrons are shared between a limited number of atoms, Covalent bond formation results in molecules rather than crystal lattices. These individual molecules can be close or far apart with a variety of interactions between them. As a result, molecular substances formed from covalent bonds can be found in all three phases, solids, liquids, and gas with a wide variety of different physical properties dependent upon how atoms and electrons arrange themselves in the molecule. Regardless of whether electrons are transferred or shared, any type of chemical bond forms for one reason, because the new arrangement of electrons lowers the overall potential energy between the charged particles and the atoms involved. In this potential energy diagram, R on the x-axis represents the distance between charged particles. Smaller values on the left of the axis indicate that the particles are close together, while larger values on the right indicate they're farther apart. The y-axis is potential energy of the particles, with high potential energy situations indicated at the top of the axis and lower potential energy situations at the bottom of that axis. The blue line represents the potential energy interactions between two like-charged particles, like two protons. When the protons are close together, they have a very high potential energy because they're pushing each other farther apart. Like charges repel. And that potential energy decreases the farther apart those particles get and the weaker that repulsive force becomes. The green line at the bottom represents the potential energy for two oppositely charged particles, like a proton and an electron. These particles feel an attractive force towards each other, bringing them closer together. And that attractive force means that the potential energy of these two particles actually is decreased the closer they are to each other. So when two atoms approach each other, you have a multitude of competing forces between charged protons and electrons. If the electrons arrange themselves so there is a net reduction in potential energy between the atoms, a chemical bond is formed. Let's look at how this reduction in potential energy happens for ionic bond formation first. When sodium chloride is formed from the elements sodium and chlorine, we know that an atom of the metal sodium loses an electron while chlorine gains one. Both of these processes involve energy. For sodium, we're working against the attractive pull of the positive sodium nucleus for its outer negatively charged electron. It requires energy to be put into the system to pull apart these two oppositely charged particles. That means we're increasing the potential energy of sodium, as indicated by the positive enthalpy value for the ionization process, given on the left.
When that electron is gained by chlorine, however, energy is released. This is because we have an attractive force here between the nucleus of the chlorine atom and that gained electron. And we're decreasing the distance between these two oppositely charged particles. As a result, this reduction in potential energy is indicated by the negative enthalpy value on the right. Notice that the amount of energy released on the right is not enough to offset the energy gained by the ionization of sodium, though. So a chemical bond is formed when the net potential energy is reduced for the atoms involved. So this would mean that the net process should have an overall negative enthalpy value. And we know that this chemical bond actually does form and that there's a large amount of energy that's actually released when it is formed. So how does this happen? The answer lies in the formation of the ionic crystal structure. After the electron is transferred between atoms, we form two oppositely charged ions, and these ions are attracted to each other and move closer together. As all of the ions formed move together into a tightly packed crystal structure, it releases a lot of energy. This is known as the lattice energy of the compound. And if we were to add all of the different enthalpies together, associated with the process of forming both the ions and the crystal, we'd find that the net result is a negatively charged energy or enthalpy value, indicating a net reduction in energy for the sodium and chlorine involved in this process. This is the case for all ionic compounds. The largest reduction in potential energy comes from the ions moving together into that crystal lattice. In fact, the closer the ions can get to each other, the more energy that's released. Here we have a series of lattice energies for metal chlorides formed with the alkali metals in column one of the periodic table. Lithium is the smallest atom in the column, while cesium is the largest. We can see this in the distance between the ions and the crystal lattice. With the closest uh, ions, or the smallest interatomic distance occurring with the lithium chloride crystal, and the largest with the cesium chloride. We also see that the lattice energy is the most negative for the smallest distance between the ions. This indicates the greatest reduction in potential energy of the system or the most energy that's actually released in the formation of that crystal lattice. Covalent bonds are also formed because of a reduction in the potential energy that occurs as two atoms are brought together. This time, however, it's the overlap of valence orbitals between the two atoms that allows shared valence electrons to attract the nuclei of both bonding atoms. Here's another potential energy diagram, this time showing the changes in potential energy as two atoms of hydrogen are brought closer together. Notice that when the two atoms are far apart on the right-hand side of the diagram, that the potential energy of the system is close to zero. As their valence orbitals overlap, though, that potential energy starts to drop. This is because the valence electrons are now close enough to attract the positively charged nucleus of the approaching atom. And it's the strong attraction for the shared electrons to both nuclei in the bond that helps stabilize the system. Now, if the atoms come too close together, the negative repulsions between those two positively charged nuclei become stronger and the potential energy increases again. The length of any covalent bond 
corresponds to the distance at which the potential energy between the two bonding atoms is at its minimum. So for two hydrogen atoms, this is 0 0.74 picometers. The bond energy is the amount of energy that's released at that minimum. It's also the energy required to pull those two atoms apart again and break that covalent bond. Here are some average bond lengths and bond energies for several different types of carbon-carbon bonds. Covalently bonded atoms can share one, two, or three pairs of electrons between them. One shared pair results in a single bond, represented by a single dash. Two shared pairs is a double bond, represented by a double dash. And three shared pairs is a triple bond, as indicated by the triple dash. Notice that as more electrons are shared between the atoms, the bond length decreases. This is because those shared electrons are exerting an even stronger pull on the two nuclei, pulling them even closer together. Notice that the closer the two atoms can get to each other, the greater the bond energy. By convention, covalent bond energies are reported as positive values, indicating the energy required to break the bond. It's the opposite of the convention we just saw for lattice energy of ionic compounds. Just remember that covalent bond energies also represent the amount of energy released when the bond is formed. The higher the bond energy, the more energy that is released. It turns out that atoms of different elements also attract or pull bonding electrons to themselves to differing degrees. Electronegativity is a measure of, of how strongly an atom will attract bonding electrons. It's a unitless scale that's calculated based on how much energy is required to break different types of bonds. And it follows predictable periodic trends with higher values associated with the smaller nonmetals on the upper right of the periodic table. Fluorine is the most electronegative element with the strongest drawing power for electrons. And large alkali metals like cesium and francium are the least electronegative with the least attractive power for electrons. It turns out that the difference in electronegativity between two bonding atoms determines the type of bond that forms. In general, if you pair a metal with a nonmetal, like sodium with chlorine, the nonmetal has a much higher electronegativity value, usually so high compared to the metal that it pulls the electron completely towards itself, while the metal just doesn't have enough attractive power to hold on to that electron. As a result, the electron is transferred and an ionic bond forms. Pairings between two nonmetals are usually much more equal in terms of electronegativity. As a result, both atoms hold on to the electrons and the electrons are shared. The magnitude of the difference in electronegativity between two bonding atoms can be used to predict the type of chemical bond that will form between them. When the difference in electronegativity is large, greater than 1.8, the bond will be ionic. For example, sodium has an electronegativity of 0 0.9, while chlorine is 3.0. Chlorine pulls the electrons completely towards itself away from the sodium, and the bond is ionic. Two atoms of chlorine, on the other hand, when they share electrons between them, have a zero difference in electronegativity. As a result, both chlorine atoms are pulling with equal strength on those shared electrons. That means that the electrons are shared equally and we have what we call a pure covalent bond. This occurs when the electronegativity difference between two atoms is less than 0 0.4. The difference between ionic and pure covalent 
between transferring electrons and sharing equally is not necessarily a clear cutoff. Instead, it's much more of a continuum. It turns out that there are certain covalent compounds that can show some degree of ionic character. These are known as polar covalent. Consider the pairing between hydrogen and chlorine. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. It has enough attractive power for shared electrons that it will not let go of them completely to the chlorine. But it's not as strong as chlorine in pulling those electrons towards itself. As a result, the electrons actually become much closer to chlorine and we have a higher electron density on the chlorine atom. This gives it a partial negative charge. It's not a full transfer of charge, it's just a partial transfer, a partial separation or polarization of the bond. That's where the name polar covalent comes from. Since the molecule is neutral overall, the hydrogen atom develops a partial positive charge to balance the negative on the chlorine. The Greek lowercase delta symbols used here are commonly used to indicate partial charge areas on a polar covalent bond. They mean just a partial separation, not a complete transfer of the electrons. So the electrons are spending more time with the chlorine than they are with the hydrogen. You can also draw an arrow pointing to the more electronegative atom to indicate this polarization of the bond and the direction of electron pull. The development of partial charges from unequal sharing of electrons in a covalently bonded molecule can have interesting impacts on the properties of that molecule. For example, if you place a sample of a po polar covalent substance in an electric field, the molecules will actually align themselves so that all the partial negative ends are pointing to the positive electrode associated with that field. And all the partial positive ends will be pointing to the negative electrode. The more common everyday implication for these partial separation of charges, it turns out that polar substances are also much more likely to be found in condensed states like liquids and solids at higher temperatures. This is because the partial positive and negatives on separate molecules attract each other and stick together. These are called intermolecular attractions and are a major topic in chapter 11 looking at solids and liquids. In summary, chemical bonds lower the potential energy of the charged particles of the atoms bound together. For ionic compounds, this reduction in energy reflects oppositely charged ions coming together into a tightly packed crystal lattice. For covalently bonded compounds, this reduction in energy reflects the attraction of shared electrons for the two oppositely charged nuclei bound together. Finally, differences in electronegativity can be used to predict how ionic or covalent a bond will be.